First off, just a very warm welcome. I know a lot of visitors uh, in town today. Maybe you're visiting family back from college, wherever you may be. We're glad uh, that you're with us. Just two special guests, uh, two of our priests that are celebrating today. Father Michael Pratt is a Stillwater native, will be familiar to a lot of you, grew up here. Uh, Father Pratt's the vocation director for the Diocese of Tulsa. Uh, And then Father James Porter, again familiar in and around Stillwater, is the associate pastor at St. John Catholic Student Center with OSU closed, St. John's is closed. And so we get a bunch of priests for Christmas Eve. Welcome. Good to have you both. We are uh, at Christmas, and Christmas has been coming for the last month or so, or uh, if you maybe start celebrating after Halloween, whenever it may be, uh, we get pretty fired up for Christmas, and and rightly so. Um, Christmas is such a beautiful time of year, December into January, And what's so beautiful about it is kind of all the stuff around Christmas. Um, It it puts us in the mood, the music, the decorations, the food, the family, right? All of these things kind of leading up to this big event, this night, when we celebrate the birth of Jesus. Those are attractive things about Christmas, I think the other attractive thing just about the Christmas story, even to non-believers, is there's just something about a baby. When a baby shows up, it's hard to be in a bad mood. When a baby shows up in your living room or in your office or anywhere around you, right? There's a certain kind of joy that just comes with there being a baby there. One of the beautiful things here in our parish Um, is a lot of babies. The joyful noise that babies make in the middle of Mass. So often people come up, moms and dads after Mass, and they're like, I'm so sorry for my, my kid was making noise. I don't hear it. Now, maybe if you're right next to it, maybe you hear it, right? But it's such a beautiful noise. What it means is that our parish has a future. The beautiful presence of a child, it makes everything that much better. The other part about Christmas, I think people love the story of a family, Mary and Joseph and Jesus overcoming obstacles, finding their place, giving birth, and then the joy that comes with that. It's a very compelling story. We love the story of Christmas for all of those reasons. But I think we'd be missing the point of Christmas if we just left it at that. If we just said, isn't it great that Jesus was born? There's a deeper level that I think we want to look at of not just that Jesus was born and all of the good that surrounded that. We heard in the gospel today, the angels coming, the shepherds, right? In a couple weeks, we'll celebrate the, the magi coming and bringing him gold and frankincense and myrrh. If we just left it at he was born and isn't that great, we'd be missing the point. If you go back to the early church, There's a phrase, I've heard it many times over the years, and I want to share it with you tonight. And it's a connection between Jesus being born and Jesus dying. Many of the early church fathers would say that the wood of the crib becomes the wood of the cross. Now, not literally. They didn't take the crib And turn it into a cross. But figuratively, right? The the wood of the crib becomes the wood of the cross. In order to understand the birth of Jesus, we have to understand the death of Jesus. Because that's why he came. He came to die. Now, before you say, this is the worst Christmas homily I've ever heard. It's all about death. Oh my gosh. No, no, no. Right? We have to understand the whole story. We have to understand why he came, why he died, and then, of course, why he rose again from the dead. All of it is connected. And so we got to know the whole story. And the whole story goes all the way back to the beginning. If you go back to the, the first book of the Bible, to the book of Genesis, the early chapters of Genesis, what we see is creation. God creating the world. God creating humanity. And if we read that story closely, what we see is that when God creates the heavens and the earth, he calls it good. 
When God creates the plants and the animals, he calls it good. And then God creates humanity, and he calls it very good. That humanity, the creation of you and me, is the pinnacle of creation. God created us good, right? That's a basic fact that we need to get into our hearts, that you are good. You were created good. You were created to do good, to love, and to be loved. But then the story goes on. Sin enters the world, right? If we're honest with ourselves, right? I'm good, but I'm also a sinner. I was created good, but also sometimes do things I'm not supposed to, and you do too. We call it sin. Sin enters the world, and what sin does is it creates a gap between you and me, right? My sin affects you. Your sin affects me. But it creates, more importantly, a gap between us and God. And so picture this kind of canyon or picture this kind of just large gap. We're on one side and God is on the other. Well, how are we going to mind that gap? How are we going to get get the the bridge? How are we going to make this and put it all back together? Well, God, in his love does not want us to live with our sin. We were not meant to carry our sin around. And so at a certain point in history, we heard it today, at a certain point in history, God sent his son. Jesus, born to Mary and Joseph in a particular place, Bethlehem, at a particular time, God enters into humanity. And all that is good. And we can say, wow, it's just amazing, right? But what was it for? Why did God become one of us? Why do we celebrate what we call the incarnation, the enfleshment of God? Why did he do it? He came to save us. God knew that there was this gap. Sin entered into our goodness. And God had to do something about it. And so he sends his son. And that son grew up in a beautiful family. For the first 30 years of his life, he lived with Mary and Joseph. And then again, at a certain point in history, around the age of 30 or so, he began a three-year public ministry. He began teaching. He began going out and healing. He began bringing people back from the dead. Those three years we have detailed in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. God came into the world. He taught. He did these miracles. And then again, at a certain point in history, he was arrested, tortured, put on a cross, and he died. And then three days later, he rose from the dead, right? This is amazing stuff, amazing news. Sometimes I think we can take Christmas or we can take Easter and we can kind of sanitize it. We make it kind of unmessy, even though it very much is. God came to save us. That gap existed when sin entered the world and God came to close that gap, to build a bridge. And he did that in the person of Jesus Christ who comes to us as a baby. This is the good news of Christmas. This is what we're doing here. It's not just, wow, God became man. That would be amazing. But God became man for a particular purpose, for you and me to save us. We were created good. Sin enters the world. God enters into the story out of love for us to close that gap. And we could stop right there and it'd be pretty good. But there's another piece to the puzzle. There's another piece to the story. And that's our response to what God has done. What is our response to God's goodness? When you're given a gift tonight, tomorrow, under your tree, somebody brings you something. What's your response to that? Do you sort of take it and put it off to the side? Do you open it up with excitement? Do you say thank you? Do you write a thank you note, right? When we receive a gift, there ought to be some kind of response. 
What is your response to what God has done for you? That's the other part of the story. And it's the part that sometimes we miss. We can look at Christmas and say, gosh, isn't this great? What a beautiful time of year. But what is our response to God's goodness? And that's an important part of being a disciple. What is our response? Is it to be lukewarm? Is it to ignore what God has done? Right? You and I, we have that option. God will not make us love him. Our response can be to ignore it. Our response can be lukewarm. Or what I hope is that our response to God becoming one of us, to bridging that gap, to going to the cross, dying for our sins, and being raised from the dead, that our response to that is a life of generosity and discipleship lived through him and with him and in him. That's the life that you and I are called to live. And it's not easy. It's actually quite difficult at times. God makes demands on us. To live a life of generosity can be very difficult. To get to Mass every Sunday can be difficult. To be involved in the life of the church here or wherever you're from can sometimes be difficult. To pray every day sometimes can be difficult. But that's the generous response that the Lord is asking of us to what he has done for us. We were created good, you and me. God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. We cannot say that enough. I've said this before and I'll say it again, that if you were the only person who ever lived, that Jesus Christ would have died on the cross just for you. Just for you. He would have done all of this. That may be hard to believe. You think, me? Little old me? Yeah, little old you. That's the beauty and the good news of Christmas. It's the beauty of the gospel. That God did all of this for you, for you and for me. And so what is our response? Is it to ignore? It's one option. Is it to just kind of go along and get along, lukewarm? That's an option. But what I hope coming out of Christmas, moving into 2023, I hope that our response can be one of great generosity. God is calling you and me to be his disciples, to follow him, to respond generously to this love that he has done for us. That's the message of Christmas. The wood of the crib became the wood of the cross. The birth and the death and the resurrection, it's all together. And so as we go forth this night, as we go out into the world, I hope we can take this good news with us, that Jesus was born, that he grew up, that he became a great teacher, a miracle worker, all of that good. And then he went to the cross, he died, he rose again for you and for me. That's the great good news of Christmas. May we celebrate it with great joy. May the peace that only Christ can give come into your life and into mine, and in the life of our city, in the life of this parish. May our response to Christ's goodness be a life of goodness, a life lived for him. The wood of the crib became the wood of the cross, dying for you and me so that we might live This is the great message of Christmas. And so I say to you all, what's your response? What will it be? What will the year ahead look like? Same old, same old? Lukewarm? No response? I hope your response and mine will be one of generosity. Generosity to the goodness of God who loves you.